Hi everyone, welcome to the second last Festival of Urbanism event. Um, I'm Nicole Gurren, I'm a Professor of Urban and Regional Planning here at the University of Sydney and I chair the urbanism um, discipline within the School of Architecture, Design and Planning. Before we get started, let me acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and it's on their unceded lands that the University of Sydney is built. So as we share our own thoughts and discussions and learning and research within the university, let us acknowledge the knowledge that's forever embedded within that the Aboriginal custodianship of country. So I'm delighted to be able to welcome my long-term uh, colleague, Professor Peter Phibbs, Chair of, um, well, sorry, the Director of the Henry Halloran Trust and Professor of Urban and Regional Planning here at the University of Sydney. Peter is an economist, a planner, a provocateur, um, and Peter is going to be giving us a master class this afternoon in hacking a government report. I know I'm going to learn a lot. I'm looking forward to it. Um, the way that the session will run is Peter's going to share a little bit of his method with us. He's going to be drawing on a recent government report and we very much encourage those of you who are listening and watching to pose some questions, maybe some commentary, keep it nice. And we'll get to it sort of about two thirds of the way through, Peter. So Peter, why are your interest in helping citizens hack a government report? Well, Nicole, um, I think as a, a, as a scholar, you know, like yourself, um, we're always interested in the quality of evidence. Um, people are taking a position. Uh, we really want to see some good quality evidence to support that position. And then certainly there's something we do every day, like from marking a first year assignment to marking a, a PhD. Uh, you're looking at whether people have got evidence in, in their work to support their particular claims. And I think that one of the things that's worried me, you know, I was previously a, a, a bureaucrat before I became an academic. I think over time we've seen a bit of a slide in standards of what actually is in um, a government report. And unfortunately, a lot of ones probably I've read in the last 10 years or so have been uh, trying to pretend there's a lot of evidence in their report to, to um, back positions the reports are taking, but I've been a bit dismayed by the quality of that evidence. So. I've been thinking about it for a while and actually I've, I've talked, talked uh, my approach over with a, a number of um, bureaucrats I know um, to help me sort of refine the method and I've sort of come up with something that I think the average citizen might be able to apply when they're reading a government report to give it a bit of a scorecard um, as a way of, of um, illuminating for, for themselves but also trying to provide some feedback to the, to the government authors about what they think about the quality of that of, of that um, taxpayer funded work and th that's the issue the bureaucrat is getting paid by the by the citizen who is trying to evaluate the report i'm hoping this will provide a little bit of a feedback loop so the citizen can feel a bit more empowered when they evaluate the quality of those reports okay sounds good it actually reminds me of one of the ways that you used to teach people in economics and we'd take a report and we'd start to deconstruct it. And, you know, at the beginning, it'd look big, it'd look really daunting. There's a lot of words, there's a lot of references in it that, yeah. you know, thinking, oh, my God, how could we critique this? So tell us, Peter, what's your method? Okay, the, um, the method's reasonably simple, Nicole. Um, it's sort of like three steps, okay? So... Um, the first step is to look in, in, in the report for the number of, of what the citizen might call a reference, what um, a scholar or a student might call a citation. Um, and, and the way you usually see that, you, you'll read the text and I'll have in brackets, Smith 2010. So you'll, you'll go look up Smith in the reference list and you can see a, a, a piece of other work that's trying to support the claim in the document. So you simply go and count the number of, of citations or references in, in the report. You put that to one side. Then you go through those lists of, of, of references and you score each one 
based on the quality of the evidence in that, in, in that particular citation. Um, and we're going to talk about the scoring system in a, in a minute to show people how that works. And then you simply um, work out the fraction of the, the quality score divided by the total citations. So if, if the score is, is greater than one, I'm saying, okay, well, then say, that's saying something positive about the quality of the evidence in the report. If the score is less than one, it's sort of saying the evidence is pretty thin. And, you know, it's something that we always teach our students in an assignment. If the only things they're quoting, for instance, are reports of lobbyists, and a lot of students get on Google and they discover that the Urban Task Force and the Property Council write a lot of things about planning, and they, they love to put those in their, in, in their planning essay because they're easy to find. But as a scholar, you'd probably rank lobbyists' um, reports pretty low down in terms of the quality of evidence. And we'll look at that shortly. So what report are you going to use? To okay, the, the hack? okay, the one we're um, the one we we're actually looking at today is a, a recent um, report from the New South Wales um, Product Productivity Commission. Okay, we put out a green paper on, on, on productivity. And we're not going to look at the whole report. It was quite a long report. We're just going to look at uh, section seven, which was to do with uh, planning. And um, I think, um, I think, Nicole, the uh, Productivity Commission is embedded in the New South Wales Treasury. Um, and uh, I think um, you might have been involved in a, in a previous report where um, we, we took to task a, a New South Wales Treasury submission to um, the planning reform paper back, you know, back must be seven or eight years ago now. Evidence Free Zone, I think, was the name of the paper. Yeah, and from memory, um, I think we tried to track down the evidence that was used in that report, not dissimilar to the method that you're just describing. And what we found was that some of the claims, in fact, dare I say, all of the claims that were being made about both the planning system, but also the potential for planning reform to fix some of those big things, that the evidence just didn't stack up. So is that what you're talking about today? Yeah, yeah. I think I think I'm sort of taking that method that we uh, we started there and trying to systematize it a little bit more. So um, maybe someone that's not an academic could write a paper like ours just based on on this little method. And and one of the things Nicole that I I found really interesting was um, when I was reading the New South Wales Productivity Commission paper some of the same references that were in that, <laughs> the, in that early treasury paper that you, you um, did such a good job of critiquing, still, they still get a reference. Uh -huh. So you sort of think, well, that was maybe seven or eight years ago, you sort of think that um, treasury might have come up with some new sources to support their claims about planning, but uh, they still relied on the old faithful. Cool. And uh, they had, anyway, we'll, we'll get back to that. We'll get back to that. But I, I was quite surprised they, um, they hadn't managed to dig up some new material. All right. So I'm guessing that those dodgy uh, references might have got, what, a zero or a minus? Can, uh, you, can you give us the score for the green paper using your method? Okay. Let, let, me, um, let, me, let me just first show you the, um, that, that sort of quality scoring system okay. that, that we're using. Okay. So um, the, the method is we, we go and um, find the citations, okay? In the New South Wales Productivity Paper in the planning section, I found 13 citations or references. And then I scored each of the references using this system, okay? So evidence that was reviewed by other experts, so something that might be an academic uh, paper where there's a, a peer review process and that peer review process is a blind review, that, that gets the most points. You get a three points, that's a good quality evidence. And, um, you, you see, unfortunately, uh, this thing where government agencies write a report and then they write another report and they just cite the previous report. Now, that worries me because you're just citing yourself. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's not really seen as um, great evidence. That gets a zero. A consultant report for government. Okay, this is just think of Utopia. I love that episode in Utopia where um, the agency went to, went to uh, the consulting firm uh, trying to explain what they wanted in the job. And the moment the government uh, person from the Utopian agency uh, told uh, the consultants what they're looking for, all the consultants who are all men in suits leaned in. Very listening, very hard, because essentially they're getting their instructions from the client. So 
Generally, um, consultant reports, unless there's been a peer review process, I'm a bit skeptical of the report. So um, there was a report, for instance, mentioned in the green paper by you know quite a good consulting firm, but I, I couldn't actually read it because it wasn't available. So a report like that gets a zero. Industry lobby groups, as I, as I mentioned, um, get zero. I was tempted to actually give them a negative score, but I couldn't. So zero, <laughs> zero for the Urban Task Force and um, the Property Council. University working papers, okay, they're not peer reviewed, but they're written by um, a scholar who, uh, who I, I think hasn't got a horse in the race. They're just interested in something, but I haven't gone through a peer review process yet at two points. Um, government agencies that are focused on research, people like the CSRR are given two points. And if it's a story by an independent journalist um, that uh, is, in, in, in engages with some research, I'm, I'm gonna give one point. So um, I've, added, uh, I, I've added all those, um, th those uh, points up for um, the um, green the paper, paper study. Yeah, and I, I come up with a score of, for the 13 references, they get a score of nine. And the reason, they, the reason they get that is a couple of things. One is um, they use a university um, working paper, okay, which is funnily enough, um, Otto and Git Gittleman from 2010 mm -hmm. that we, we saw previously. Yeah. And the dilemma with that paper, um, even though I've got nothing against the, the individual academics, the dilemma of that paper, they were using um, data from 2006. Nice. And, the, the green paper is trying to say, um, using um, that paper as evidence, that the, the planning system is unresponsive to demand or unresponsive to price signals. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that worries me about that claim, you can't prove how to reform today's planning system using 2006 data. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how much, Nicole, has the planning system changed since 2006 in New South Well, Wales? there's been an ongoing process of reform. Don't get me started. Yeah, <laughs> It'll yeah. take more than an hour, hour and we might lose some of our listeners. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'd, be like, it'd be like trying to do a review of a car, you know, right. like what, 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 a, you know, what a VW is like using a 2006 car. It's just so out right. of date. Um, I, I just had to discard that. So I originally scored it with two points okay. as a working paper. I gave it zero. Yeah. Um, the other thing I did was um, I actually, uh, they also, for that same claim that the planning system's not responsive, they used uh, an, another New South Wales Treasury report. And when I actually went and read that report and I, and, you know, I read it um, word for word, it didn't actually say anything directly about that issue. Yeah. So that is at that point i do use a negative score uh -huh. if someone in a, and we'll, we'll do this with a student if a student uses a reference that actually doesn't um support their claim that is a seriously bad thing to do mm -hmm. um you know it's essentially uh it's essentially what um academics would call strategic misrepresentation mm -hmm. um I, other people might call it lying mm -hmm. so that got a that got a score of um minus three because mm -hmm. of that Okay, so right. the, the other thing I did, the other thing I did, and this also annoys, it certainly annoys academics, and you know, I apologize to the New South Wales Productivity Commission if we've gone a bit crazy here, but a number of times in that in their document, they say there is evidence to show that you know planning causes cancer or whatever claim they're making, but they don't tell us the evidence. Mm -hmm. And if they've, got, if they've got a green paper where they actually are providing evidence, just to say there's evidence without showing it, again, I, I find that um, very annoying. So they've done, they've done that at least once and I've, I've subtracted a score for that. Mm -hmm. So, so we've got of, 9 out of 39. 39? No, 13, 13. 13 references, possible yeah. total score of 39. Yeah, yeah, and they end up with and 9. And they end up with yeah, 9. Yeah, yeah, thank Gosh. you, thank you. So, so it is a fail mark. Uh, it's a revise and a resubmit. It's a revise and resubmit uh, on the quality of the evidence. Yeah, if you if you can't if you can't get your score over one, which isn't a high bar, you know, you don't need thirteen peer reviewed papers. You just need things that are a little bit more robust. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think they got there. Okay. And you know that that that, that worries me right. because you know they're talking about important public policy issues. I just think we should have a more evidence rich debate, mm -hmm. um, not a rant from people that uh, you know, basically um, probably thought the same thing before they actually started the report. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, a lot of things are, that were in that report were just basically carryovers from their submission to mm -hmm. the planning reform process seven okay. or eight years ago. 
So then, Peter, I mean, <laughs> that's a bit of a worry. But there, it's quite a big green paper and the section on planning is pretty chunky. So what about some of the observations anyway? If we say, you know, maybe they needed to, to, to find some better references, but can you give us a flavour for the content and what you think uh, about the actual content? Okay, now thanks for that question, Nicole. But the, the, the sort of the main argument in the paper is to say there's a shortage of dwellings in, in Sydney yeah. and the reason there's a shortage of dwellings is planning. Okay, so they're two big claims. Yeah. You know, first, they'd have to prove there's a shortage. Mm -hmm. And second, they'd have to ascribe the shortage to planning mm -hmm. and not some other issue like lack of finance, um, uh, risk issues with development, um, difficulty, difficulty getting, you know, builders in, in different parts of the building cycle. Um, but the claim is, is, is pretty direct. There's a shortage and, and there's planning. So um, let me just show you a, a couple of slides they use to show that there's a shortage. Okay, and th this one, it's, it's a figure 7.1 from the report. And it says um, uh, it, there's a shortage because the number of housing completions were less than the, the housing targets put out by the Department of Planning. Okay, so they've got a list of the housing targets. You can see over time the housing targets have gone up in Sydney. And except for uh, 2017, 18 and 19, we haven't met those targets. Hence, there, be a, there must be a shortage. Now, the thing I'd say about the, that, that slide, Nicole, is the other conclusion you could make looking at that is perhaps the targets are wrong. You know, why, why not investigate that as a potential issue rather than saying, um, we, we, the housing supply is not keeping up. And the, the thing that worries me about the targets, for instance, the process they use uh, is not recognising what we've seen so much with, in our research. Like a lot of the increasing population in Sydney are people like students and um, temporary migrants um, that are they're, they're a significant part of the sort of 80 or 90,000 of, of new residents that come to Sydney every year. A lot of those people aren't living in your standard house. It's not like um, a, a normal sized household. We know a lot of those people crowd up. Um, they're, they're in um, quite, quite small households with a lot of people. And I would argue because of that, the housing targets really need to be adjusted. So, so for instance, one of the things the housing targets don't include are special purpose student housing. You know, So um, things like Uni Lodge, uh, um, housing that's provided on university campus because um, those houses haven't got self-contained um, kitchens um, they're not included in the ABS dwelling completion figures mm -hmm. so the Department of Planning and their targets don't allow for that they certainly didn't allow for that in those early earlier projections and as a result I think probably the targets are really overestimates and we'll talk a little bit about why mm -hmm. that might be the case mm -hmm. so I just think they just jump quickly to that to that conclusion that mm -hmm. that because the targets are excellent, we didn't meet the targets, therefore there must be a shortage. But the other slide I think is even um, more compelling. Mm -hmm. I love this one. Okay, so this is housing under supply. Okay, from 2006 all the way to 2036. It looks alarming. Peter. It does look alarming, and it says we'll continue with our changes to the planning system. Right now. The thing that um, really kills me about this, because I actually went and read the technical paper that was used to create this model, and um, they, were, they were good enough in the, in the report to at least admit in their technical note um, one of their assumptions. And their assumptions were that they, they assumed everyone was living in the same uh, way um, all through that period as they were in 2006. Okay, so the number of persons per dwelling was going to be the same across right up to 2036 um, as it was in 2006. Now, we know, Nicole, that's just not true. What we've seen in Sydney, like many other cities, Melbourne, for instance, over time, since housing's got more expensive since 2006, the number of persons per dwelling has actually increased. And it's uh, in the 2016 census, it showed it increased quite significantly. Now, the thing that kills me about the Treasury it's full of economists. The first thing, the day one in economics training, you learn the relationship between supply and price. Okay, so and supply, price and demand. So as the price of housing has gone up in, in Sydney and other places, 
people have demanded less space. Okay, so they're crowded up, um, particularly lower income people, you know, particularly people who say on unemployed benefits or, or pensions and beneficiaries. And as a result, the person's per household has gone up significantly over time. When they first wrote that, that technical paper, they said they could see that it actually happened um, in the 2011 census, but they thought it was just a little blip in time caused by the GFC. Hasn't been that at all. It's the, the person's per dwelling has consistently gone down as a result of increasing prices. And when you apply the 2016 person's per dwelling, instead of a shortage um, that, that is on that slide, um, there's actually a surplus of dwellings now in Sydney. I'm sure you've got a slide to show that. No, no. Um, funnily enough, I haven't. I haven't. But I've got, I've got, I'm better still, Nicole, I've got a few statistics okay. about the rental market. Now, this is the other thing that kills me about an economic agency. They're using um, as evidence um, essentially um, very indirect measures of um, uh, a shortage. Okay, if you're an economist, the way you look for a shortage is you look at the price effect. And the price you look at, and the New South Wales um, Housing Strategy Discussion paper made this point, the price you look at isn't house prices, it's rents. Okay, and what we've seen in Sydney since 2016, uh, a two bedroom um, apartment, this is from the New South Wales Housing Written Sales Report, was $530 a week in 2016. In 2019 and 2020, it's 520. Okay, so if, if there was a dr dramatic shortage that, we, that um, we saw on that graph, if that was true, we wouldn't have rents going down. And that's the thing that just I'm completely gobsmacked about why a group of uh, economists sitting in Treasury wouldn't look at a price if they think there's a shortage. I think we need to ex to clarify for anyone who is following and thinking their lived experience is at the very bottom of the market, an absolute shortage of affordable rental housing. And that's been demonstrated by report after report. What we're seeing, Peter, is a crowding at the bottom and Absolutely. a shortage of affordable housing at the bottom, but no absolute shortage of dwellings. Absolutely. So... so so, yeah, you know, and I completely, completely agree with that. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, um, one of them is um, things like New Start just really haven't kept up properly with inflation. So, so we've, income we've got support. an income. We've got an income support problem at the bottom. So people, are, people on on those benefits are really getting squeezed in the rental market. But certainly, people at the bottom of the market are really experiencing a lot of housing stress, mm -hmm. and they're driving a lot of that increase in crowding. Mm -hmm. So. If you're, going to, if you're going to fix that issue up, um, you've got to really target that affordable end of the market. You know? So um, you, you want to talk about housing supply, the supply you really need to generate is lower income housing supply. And if you're, if you're a government, one mm -hmm. of the things you do is you can simply go and build it. So mm -hmm. look what happened in Melbourne, mm -hmm. We're going to build an extra 12,000 um, social housing dwellings. That's how you'd attack the affordable end of the end of the of the market. Mm -hmm. And the thing that really worries me about the discussion about planning, it's almost like we don't have to do that because all we've got to do is reform the planning system some more and miraculously we're going to improve housing outcomes for everyone. Um, meanwhile, the people really in housing stress are just going to keep sitting there in stress in the market. Mm -hmm. And and you know, that's the thing that that you know, I'm concerned about. Right. It's a distraction from the main argument mm -hmm. about helping people um, in, in, the, in that housing stress. Mm -hmm. The supply problem isn't a total market supply problem, mm -hmm. it's a supply problem at the bottom of the market. Right. So if we're gonna have targets for new housing supply, it's about targets for affordable. Absolutely, housing. absolutely. And you know, the, the, the thing that um, if they were trying to improve the methodology for mm -hmm. housing targets in New South Wales planning mm -hmm. we just talked about, certainly having two sets of targets, a total supply target mm -hmm. and a target for that affordable end of the market would be a really important um, improvement right. for planning. So Peter, tell us then what you think about the overall recommendations in the report. You've, you've okay. demolished the evidence. <laughs> You've demolished the model. What do you think about the recommendation? Okay, I'm just going to um, share with the to share with the um, the festival goers um, just the draft recommendations in the in the green paper. So 
um, a range of things about updating planning documents. Now, I'll just make a couple of comments about that. One is at the top of those recommendations, I think really what they're describing is what's going on in the planning system at the moment, right? So there's a recommendation for a productivity uh, improvement that's really just reporting current practice. So I find that a bit weird because, you know, one of the suggestions you, you, um, you might have is um, maybe they should talk to um, that agency that got a bit of a talk yet, uh, mentioned yesterday at the festival, the Greater Sydney Commission, to um, see how their process works. But the thing I probably want to focus on, Nicole, in being critical is probably the last one. Okay, and this is a common misconception um, in terms of planning reform that's pushed a lot by the development lobby and it's just so nonsensical. I can't believe that the Productivity Commission's um, tried to put it up in a draft recommendation. So they're asking for councils to monitor housing forecasts and projections. They're supposed to monitor housing completions on a, on a six monthly basis. Now where housing shortfalls arise, okay, so where where they're, you know, if you like, the council housing target isn't being met by completions in their area, so um, the market's not responding, the council's supposed to go and revise their housing strategy and local strategic planning statements to indicate how the shortfalls will be remedied. I should interrupt you there, Peter, just in case we've got anyone listening internationally. When you're talking about a council shortfall, you just mean the total supply target. You're not talking about the councils building any social housing. No, no, it's like just that. it's just the in the council area, you know, the local government area, say City of Sydney, uh, their target is is twelve thousand houses, um, six thousand to 000, be built by the market. To be built by the market, only six thousand arise. Right. There's a shortfall, so they should go and revise their housing strategy and local strategic planning statements. Now, the thing that worries me about this is there's 50 other reasons other than those two documents that might explain why there's a shortfall. So, for instance, look what's going to happen in the next two years in Sydney. You know, we've closed the borders. Um, there's, not much, there's not going to be much demand for new housing. Uh, developers basically build housing in Sydney when someone expresses a, a uh, contractual uh, wish to to um, buy it so they they might buy an apartment off the plan or they buy a greenfield site to put a house on that's not going to be happening as much as it as it used to because simply we haven't got a lot of um, uh, people in Sydney we're going to have a record low population growth for the next few years now does that mean that every council in Sydney should go and revise their planning documents I, I mean that'd be stupid you know, like the product, some other things to do. There'll be some other things to do. The productivity engagement is, is trying to reduce red tape in the planning system. That's just creating red tape. Now, what the council should do is maybe have a look at that shortfall if they can explain it by other factors, a recession, a pandemic, for instance. Maybe they should just go and, you know, go collect the garbage or, or you know, work on um, open space. Open space or doing something else. Like the, the planning system is sometimes a blockage in supply, but a lot of times there's lots of other reasons, you know, like you simply don't get a, a you know, a, a DA, you don't like go put it on a, on a piece of dirt and add water, you suddenly got a house, <laughs> like that'd be good. Um, there's lots of other things that can happen. If the development industry doesn't um, engage, if there is no one that wants to buy those new properties, mm -hmm. and, and the big issue is when the price goes down, Okay, like it did in um, two th end of 2018 and early 2019. When the price goes down, people withdraw from the market. They're waiting for the price, price um, see if the price is going to keep going down. So in, in, in those cases, you do get a, a, a blockage in supply. Nothing to do with planning. It's just the market cycle operating. So people have got to get out of their head that as soon as there's a supply problem, the answer is always, or the blame is always the planning system. They have to really do some analysis. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, the New South Wales Treasury dudes, um, maybe, you know, you, you should really be grinding that analysis hard, not just simply getting the old let's blame planning card. Um, it's just pretty poor public policy, I think. Mm, because it's plausible, you know, and there's no doubt that in some jurisdictions, in some places, Planning may operate as a constraint, but what you're saying is that the evidence presented in this report and previous reports 
didn't stack up in yeah, this instance. Yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not trying to defend planning in all jurisdictions. Sure. In, in, you know, if I was living, you know, for instance, in San Francisco, I'd be demonstrating on the street right. about, you know, some of the planning issues there. Right. But you know, maybe that's a talk for another day. Nicole. <laughs> maybe you, maybe yeah. that's right. But yeah. in a place like Sydney, and, and um, our um, housing economist uh, Cameron Murray, you know, has done um, a lot of work on this. And he's used some um, uh, metrics that um, our old friend Ed Glazer actually um, produced to look at response units to planning. Sydney, okay, when he, when he benchmarked it against Houston, which is the poster child of people that hate planning because it hasn't got a zoning system, and, um, and also um, uh, Dallas, you know, that also is seen as a, a progressive sort of low constraint city. Sydney, you know, absolutely whipped both of those cities in terms of the amount of approvals that were pushed out. Um, over the last decade. Okay, so we're good at doing approvals in Sydney. Peter, how do you think, and I'm sure we've got a lot of questions coming through now, I can see some, so we'll get to those in a moment. But Peter, how do you think we could improve then the understanding of planning in government in New South Wales at least? Um, I think, Nicole, I think um, one of the things we could do is actually try and um, get these agencies to hire some you know, real life planners. Mm -hmm. And um, I know sometimes they hire people that have done planning, but I, I think probably they should second some planners um, into the agencies to help them understand what the process is. Um, there's a lot of people bad mouthing planning, um, and I sort of get that. If I was a developer, I'd be bad mouthing planning, trying to get a competitive advantage. But maybe they should be trying to listen um, a little bit harder to what planners are actually saying. And there's a, a, a lot of planners that I think would probably give um, agencies like the Treasury pretty good advice. Yeah. Yeah. But um, let me ask you a question, Nicole. <laughs> Okay. okay. You, know, you know, it's not all about you asking me questions. Right. Um, what, you know, looking at that, you, I mean, you've obviously read a lot of government documents that have had recommendations about planning. What sort of, you know, if, if you were the New South Wales Productivity Commissioner, for instance, what, what sort of recommendations? Because, you know, I, I guess we've both committed to try and improve mm -hmm. the system. Um, what sort of recommendations do you think would make sense for, um, for a, a, a view on trying to improve the planning performance in terms of, Sure. housing supply sure and i mean look it's a economic productivity report but it does talk about housing and if we take housing for instance then yeah absolutely we want affordable homes but i don't actually see anything in that report about saying we want to produce homes that are affordable for instance for teachers nurses childcare workers retail assistants that people that economic productivity in the city at least depend on and people who can't afford at the moment to get a home in the city. So you want to see something about that. You might want to see something, for instance, about where we build and making sure that our cities and our regional settlements are built in the right place and that our homes and our buildings are built in the right way for the future. Absolutely critical to economic productivity, I would argue now um, and for um, and forever, certainly with looming climate change. And you might want to see something, for instance, about how we transition to a low carbon future because we know that that transition needs to occur in the built environment. So I would want to see something in a productivity green paper about how we can use our planning system to make that transition. Does it? Okay. Just a couple of starting points that sure. we might want to look at in the revise and resubmit version. Okay, Peter. okay, excellent, excellent. Um, that'll be good. I'll be looking forward to reading that one. Um, the other thing I think that it's important to say, though, particularly in terms of building that understanding within government about the planning system, and we know that the planning minister in New South Wales is actually probably the most qualified planning minister of anyone in the world. So in addition to listening to expertise, our planning minister has a PhD in environmental planning and a master's in planning and urban design. So in addition to listening to expertise within government and beyond government, I think it's really important that people do take the ideas that you've put forward in terms of how to deconstruct government information like this and think about the harm actually that putting forward misinformation can do but it also means that we don't ask the difficult questions about our planning system for instance you know are we building in the right place and who's benefiting from planning processes so when we obsess about things that we know already 
Yeah. Which we've got a lot of recommendations in this report that we know already. It doesn't take us to the things that we actually need to do. So let's have a look um, at some of the questions. Let's start off with, there's a really great point here about government agencies accessing academic material yeah, yeah. and, for instance, published peer-reviewed papers. Peter, what would you say about that? And I think actually in Australia, I'm sure that our governments do have access via their library services to academic reports, but I think the more significant point is just the community yeah. have access to to rigorous peer-reviewed evidence. Yeah, no, that's... Um... That is a very good point, and thank you for that, Lila. I think it's, uh, you know, very problematic. Um, uh, it's something, you know, I've railed against, uh, you know, for many years. The taxpayer funds our work. We publish it in a journal, uh, and then they have to pay 50 US dollars or whatever it is to access it, and you know, obviously, you know, that that um, really stops the work getting out there. Um, I think um, there's been some improvements in that space. So if you say if you're working on a federally funded research project, you've got to make sure that um, you know so that that research is available online. Um, and a lot of universities now will publish um, uh, an earlier version of that paper. Say, for instance, someone could read in, in a research repository. Um, but yeah, that's an ongoing problem, and um, you know. We're, we can't solve it. I think it's a definitely a problem for the citizen, um, for a government agency, um, much less significant. Mm. But um, certainly one of the things I'd encourage citizens to do if they're interested in um, engaging on a topic to, um, you know, contact an academic and maybe ask them for, um, you know, a copy of their paper. Um, you can usually see the abstracts online, Nicole. Mm -hmm. So if people read the abstract and they think it's interesting, I'd always encourage them to write to the academic and, mm -hmm. um, and, and say something like, it's probably the greatest paper they've ever read the abstract of. And mm -hmm. then um, uh, there's a pretty good chance you'll get a copy. You'll get a copy even without saying that, I'm pretty yeah. sure. That was a great question from Layla Farahani, who we should acknowledge for all of her work with the UN on, the, on rights to housing. Um, coming to us from Canada, I think. Oh, okay, really. great. So thank, thank you, you for thank that you question. For that. I'd like to add to that, and I'm not sure if this is an issue globally, but certainly in Australia, organisations with the greatest funding to produce reports and to produce evidence out in the public realm, such as our industry lobby groups, often uh, there's a disconnect between the amount of money that industry groups are able to um, put into their sure, research sure. versus the amount of money that researchers in public uh, universities, for instance, are able to access or community organisations. So yeah. really um, being aware of where the sources of evidence come from when you're trying to engage with a government report is really important. And I would encourage people to get in contact with academics and also ask for government-sponsored research that is also um, able to be produced and put out into the public realm sure, as well. Sure. So another question we've got here is about the um, language that's used in relation to some of the material produced by planning agencies. And I think there's a question about people understanding the... Um, language either in academic reports but yeah. perhaps also um, in material that's produced about or by planning agencies what would you say peter in relation to the accessibility of language um yeah i think um uh, i think maybe you couldn't accuse us of that nicole but certainly <laughs> i've read um, some academic papers that are pretty dense mm -hmm. and might be harder for the citizen to engage and i'd urge my academic colleagues particularly if they're working in a public policy space um, to think about um, maybe producing a, an explainer mm -hmm. around that paper that they might be able to, um, you know, post on the on their on their website and make available um, if they think they're onto something. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the planning in the planning area, maybe that's less of a problem, but but certainly in, in um, some disciplines, yeah, I, I struggle to read them myself. Mm -hmm. um, there was a a question there, Nicole, I think from um, Halvard, who was on mm. yesterday, about consulting reports mm -hmm. that um, could be interesting to look at. 
just as as that um, question is coming up, I'd like to say something on that accessibility issue as well. And first, I want to assure citizens that when you apply Peter's hacking method, which was so simple that I think I've got it, Peter. Yeah, okay, that's good. But I don't think Peter's saying you need to go and read all of the references. You simply need to distinguish, are they using it? peer-reviewed source yeah are they using an industry lobby source are they using yeah. a source at all in yeah. fact you could even boil it down to three steps but if you do want to wade into the academic evidence i would recommend the conversation for instance yeah. which is a great source for 800 word summaries on almost yeah. any issue that's where we all became instant experts on the yeah. pandemic isn't it yeah. you know yeah. and that and work on the conversation will often link to publicly available academic work yeah. as well. Yeah. But we would hope that our government researchers producing government material actually do have the expertise and also the access to um, to proper peer-reviewed sorts of evidence, yeah. I imagine. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. for the citizen, um, uh, you know, if there's some academic references in, in a report, they can simply go, you know, read the abstract and all they're checking is that the papers that... Uh, mentions what the government agency thinks i wouldn't recommend that they have to read every, every one of those recommend papers okay so halvard's question that we've got here mm. is so this is halvard dalheim who's um you know one of australia's most prominent planners thanks halvard for um for writing in and he is asking about the quality mm. of consultancy reports it's a great question um, Peter, how would you like to? Yeah, Perhaps yeah. you could summarise the question for us and then give us a response. Oh, okay, so Halbert's how saying you, you certainly, uh, you, you, it would seem strange to say that you give every consultant report zero. Okay, and that, that yeah, and that's a good point, Halbert. Um, I was probably getting a bit ahead of myself in the, the, um, the consultant report in that document I was giving zero because I couldn't find it online. So if someone's giving me some evidence in a consultant's report that says this supports our particular position, but then there's no way for anyone to verify that, that um, position by reading the report, then that gets an immediate zero. Um, and you're right, some consultants report, particularly when they're for a more open-ended purpose, are excellent sources of um, information. And um, Halvard mentions that some consultants report reports involve a lot of detailed survey work and things like that. Um, they would, that they, Halvard, um, would be uh, potentially have a score of two, okay, particularly if they were um, peer reviewed, if there was a peer review process somewhere in that, in that process, it could be, an, you know, another consulting firm, for instance, um, sometimes an academic, uh, but the, when the consulting report isn't available for verification, then obviously it gets a zero because we've got no idea what's in it. So claiming that as evidence is, is getting ahead of myself. So yeah, going back to that slide um, where I mentioned consultants reports, I probably should have had next to consulting report a range of zero to two, depending on the mm -hmm. circumstance. And um, the, the um, case you mentioned, Halvard, where there's a lot of telephone interviews, as long as I was convinced that the um, process for selecting um, the, the respondents for that interview is robust, um, that would be probably very useful evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think if the material is out there in the public realm, that's quite different to a report that's been produced and sort of kept behind closed doors. Now, just so we'll take one or two final questions before we wrap up. And I really like this question that Tracy now has asked us. We've got a lot of good questions, so keep it coming. Um, as we've got two questions actually that are fairly similar. One is in relation to the importance of open source, primary source data i think that's really uh, that's really critical peter you might give yeah. us an answer yeah. to that and the other is whether government reports should be subject to some kind of peer review um and i really um, and i think that's a really sensible suggestion too peter what how would you react to those points yeah uh, certainly um open source data is getting is getting better mm -hmm. so um really engaged citizens mm -hmm. can you know start doing some of their own research um, New South Wales is, is, is probably doing, you know, a decent job in that space. Uh, so, um, you know, you can Google, you can Google that um, open source data and it, it goes from, from everything from transport data to health data to um, some housing data. Um, so um, that's useful. 
Um, in the planning space, um, you go to the planning portal now and there's um, excellent um, uh, data, not only on sort of current um, DAs and, and planning, planning uh, other planning issues, but there's a performance report. You can go and look at um, the performance of uh, different councils uh, in terms of the number of DAs, processing times, a whole range of things. Um, that's all good open source data. So yeah, for, for really engaged citizens, um, they can be quite useful in terms of really trawling that data hard. Um, I, I think um, if you're an agency, you should be um, peering, peer reviewing your work before you put it out in the public domain. Um, and, and you know, there, there could be various processes you come up with. Um, and I think it would help the agency themselves if they started to use um, little um, mechanisms like this before you know they went live. Okay, what is the quality of evidence? Is it convincing? Um, one of the one of the other things that um, which is I might put at the festival of the next year if anyone's kind enough to invite me, Nicole, is um, I've started a little process looking at um, housing strategy documents mm -hmm. using a same sort of scoring system, mm -hmm. and um, it's pretty simple. Um, where there's an action item in a strategy that is likely you know, to, to have some sort of impact that's measurable, mm -hmm. that gets a point. Mm -hmm. um, where it's um, simply business as usual. So if a housing strategy, for instance, says one of its actions is it's going to collect rents from public housing tenants, that's business as usual. That isn't actually an action in a strategy. I take away two points. Mm -hmm. So it's the same sort of process. So... Um, if they mentioned the word, for instance, um, investigate in a strategy or consider, that gets zero points. You know, if you're writing a strategy for 12 months or two years, you probably should have done the investigation before you produce a report. Um, it's almost like the, it's busy work. Remember we wrote out that busy work? Saying you're going to investigate something or consider it really isn't an action in a strategy. So you can, well, I'm working on a busy work index for, okay. for strategies. Okay, busy work is a reference to what governments do when they want to sound extremely concerned about housing affordability, but do absolutely nothing to, uh, to change the status quo, if we can put it that way. We should at this point um, before closing point out that things like the Green Paper, for instance, do go out on public exhibition there is a process for public submissions. I'm not sure whether the Green Paper public submissions have been published, although in many cases, government documents are published and you can look at the, at the submissions that are put by community groups, by individuals, by experts, and of course, by, um, by you know, particular stakeholder groups as well. And so people, so that is a bit of a process of peer review, which is really important. Um, yeah. I'm not sure yet whether that's occurred for the productivity green paper, but um, I think it's in we'll process. See. The, right. the thing that worries me about that process, and you see it a lot in government reports, is if they're simply only collecting evidence through that process, you know what I mean? You, they, they just get a lot of noisy voices. Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, the majority of the submissions said X or some really powerful submissions said Y. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a government agency, there's a lot of evidence out there you should be trying to collect about mm -hmm. what's going on and mm -hmm. not just relying uh, for submissions to drive that process. Because mm -hmm. in, in the planning and property space, a lot of the noise is coming from um, lobbyists and industry groups that write you know, very detailed submissions. Um, and reading of those over a long period of time, sometimes I think they're more heat than light. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, look, shall we take one last question because it relates to Airbnb, Peter? Oh, and excellent. Then, um, and then I think we'll close it off. So, so we've got a question here, which is fantastic. And look, it, the question is how we critique data that's only provided by a private operator and not publicly available. And a good example is the impact of Airbnb uh, on a local community, for instance, or a housing market when the only source of that information is provided by the operator itself. And of course, this has been a great debate in relation to Airbnb because the company refuses to provide its data to local government, state governments, you know, let alone to affected communities. So there's no way for anyone to test the claims that the company makes about its own operations. 
Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's Ben Bartle, who's from the Tenants Union in Hobart. So thanks for listening in, Ben. Um, well, a couple of strategies there. Um, one is um, a strategy that we've used in a, a Hillary report that's being released, I think, next week that looks at Airbnb in Hobart and Sydney during the pandemic um, is to uh, use a, a site like Inside Airbnb that simply scrapes data off the Airbnb website. Um, and uh, looking at looking at um, some comparisons of their data and Airbnb data when it's released, that you know, that does does seem like quite a reliable site. Mm. The other thing that I'd recommend in that case, Ben, is um, governments really need to say, okay, if Airbnb is going to operate in our jurisdiction, we need a live feed of Airbnb data. Okay, you've got to share, like you de-identify the data, you've got to share it with us. It's got to be reliable and if it's not reliable, we're going to come down on you in a, on a ton of, with a ton of bricks. Um, some governments, have, like the Tasmanian government has asked um, uh, people to um, register with the government as a way of collecting data and that's, that's probably um, of some use, but it's not really shown the intensity of, uh, of use or how much um, single dwellings have left the private rental market and ended up in Airbnb. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that, that is, a, that is a, a good question. There's no easy way, but certainly I'd encourage um, citizens to have a look at Inside Airbnb, which mm -hmm. is um, maintained by a, 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 an incredible housing activist and IT person um, named Murray Cox, who um, is an Australian living in New York, mm -hmm. who started that site because he was annoyed about Airbnb in his local community. And now he, he's got data for um, major cities across the world, mm -hmm. including many Australian cities. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, whether it's Airbnb or whether it's another public policy issue, if arguments are being made without providing the source of data that those arguments are being based on, then that's your first uh, critique, as far as I would say. Um, N Nicole, I feel like we should shout out to Halvard again, um, you know, particularly after yesterday. <laughs> um, uh, Halvard's shouting out to us. Uh, Halvard's shouting out to us. I think maybe, should we shout back? What Let's do you think? Shout. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Halvard's, Halvard's, I guess, responded to the fact that I've um, had a go at using the word investigate and Halvard said um, he's written many strategies and sometimes investigate is a way of keeping an issue live. I agree with that, Halvard. So uh, again, you know, you, 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 you're making me moderate my um, inflammatory comments and I, I appreciate that. I think then the condition I'd use is if it's an issue that you could investigate in 10 minutes that we already have evidence for, then I'm definitely subtracting um, uh, you know, a score for that in a, in a strategy document. If it's something that we don't know much about and the investigation might uncover some policy progress, I'm probably gonna let that one slide. In the housing strategies I've read, they, they ask the things that are in, that to be investigated that have been investigated seven or eight times already in Australia. And it's clearly a busy work stalling. Let's look like we're doing something when we're not doing something strategy. So um, let me moderate my position on that. And thank you, Halbert. I'm going to add that as a footnote in my method. And I'll give you a, uh, a, a shout out for, um, for um, moderating my position. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, look, it just gives us an opportunity to reflect on the different roles that people do play in yeah. the policy making yeah. and yeah. research process and we've all been there I've, I've worked in government Peter's worked in government we know the code words sometimes that governments need to use but we're saying here if you use in a strategy on housing that you're going to investigate housing affordability then the people outside of government, the people um, at the University of Sydney, for instance, will be calling you on it because <laughs> if you're saying that in Australia, that's busy work. Get over it. That's seriously busy work. <laughs> there, there was one I saw in a, in a, in a uh, I should probably mention this data, it was the ACT. And their, one of their strategies where they were, they were going to consult with the community housing sector. You know, like, get over it. You know, like, that's like business as usual. If you're at a government housing agency, you're not consulting with the, community housing sector, you're not doing your job. I'm not going to give you a score for that, for an action. If that's an action, you know, I'm Donald Trump. That's what I think. <laughs> okay, well, listen, before we go any further, I think we're going to have to let people go and have their own lunch before Peter starts to do any Donald Trump impersonations. <laughs> that could be really frightening and terrifying. So before you log off, 
log back on to the Festival of Urbanism website. Make sure you um, check out the details for tonight's Henry Halloran lecture being delivered from the UK on housing policy. I hope they're doing better over there than we've been doing lately by Ian Mulhern at 6.30pm tonight. See you there. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Nicole.